Yes. 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 yes very good. Thank you. And uh, good evening. I can say yes. I'm home in Lund, and I should also apologize really that I could not be able to to travel across the Atlantic. I got some health problems a month ago. And I'm super, super grateful to the organizers, first of all, for this very kind invitation, and then also for the understanding and giving me the chance to give this talk now by Zoom. But it's really sour to miss out on this meeting. I was just uh, saying to Simos, it's seldom that all the program of a conference is top notch on your own research interests. So that's uh, sad to miss. And uh, Tillman, I should also say that it's actually you who started this work in Lund. You remember you gave a Rüttberg colloquium some time ago in our Rüttberg Hall, because Rüttberg is actually from Lund. And that inspired us a lot to actually try to get into the theory of these fascinating filaments and dipolar droplets that you had shown us. And this will also show the impact on the on the, on the the talk that I, that I will give now here. So work very much actually inspired by your lecture back in, I think, five, five years back or four years back, just after the discovery of these nice uh, self-bound droplets. To begin with, I would like to remind all of us to the uh, trapped Bose gases in a single component in a trap. You have seen these uh, pictures of vortices since 2001, I think, or 2000 even. When you set a one component Bose gas to rotate, you form uh, uh, vortices due to the superfluid nature of the whole thing. And you get a vortex array if the trap is harmonic. And if the trap is unharmonic, you get uh, them centered at the, at, at, the, at the origin of the trap, but you get these beautiful vortex, vortex lattices. Now this is for repulsive interactions, but if you turn the attractions and the interactions attractive, it forms like a blob. And then if you put rotation to it, this whole blob is boringly slinging around in the trap. And if you make your attraction too large, it actually becomes unstable. Then one might think of the, quantum fluctuation corrections, but usually in a one component system, the size is really small and they don't have any effect. So this could at this time not really cure anything and no self-bound states were found. And I think in this community, you all know about uh, Petrov's amazing paper from 2015, where he was actually doing exactly that to take the quantum fluctuation contributions to stabilize a two component fluid. In contrast to the one component fluid, when you have two components, you can only tune the mean field so that only a very weak residual part is left. And then this residual mean field interaction balances with the quantum fluctuation contributions and possibly also other higher order corrections, but this would be the first one. There was a prediction 2002, I think, by Bulgak. Uh, he, he went to three body and Efimov type of things and so on, which was a little bit in the same spirit. But this here really brought it into the realm of quantum fluctuations as the main correcting or stabilizing mechanism. And uh, I show now some almost simultaneous. You see, you, it's very interesting to notice the year here. This was in 2016. So just shortly after, after the uh, Petrov paper, and this was for dipoles, when it was known that these, these dipoles form, form filaments, they self-stabilize. This is one of uh, one of the papers, the early papers from uh, Tillman's group. There was a previous one, Padao et al. in Nature, showing uh, also these this self-bound droplets. And I think this must have been the things that you showed us in Lund that were so amazing to, to, to see that you really form these dipolar elongated self-bound droplets because of the stabilization through these quantum fluctuation contributions. And when you put them in a waveguide, the magnetic friction makes that when you press from the top, this, when you have a single droplet, this splits into many small ones. Because of the magnetic friction, it really doesn't like that you push it from the top. And this is what you saw in this paper here, that when you have them in a waveguide, these droplets, they know about each other's repulsion. And unfortunately, they then go far apart because they repel each other. And the waveguide is really sort of not the best thing to make them overlap, which is what one wants to do, thinking of this very old riddle of what is a supersolid. When you have superfluids overlapping, you might think that you get this supersolid state that I think has been discussed so much on this conference already that I don't need to spend so many more, more words on it. This, what you showed us in Lund here was very inspiring because we thought then when you have these, these droplets repelling each other, 
why not put them in a ring? I mean, the super solid has first been found, as we all know, from this elliptic confinement where you have maybe three or four droplets and then you put them in, a, in an anisotropic harmonic oscillator. You maybe have three or four of them and then you can observe the elementary modes and excitations. We thought a little bit different here and we thought that why not put this on a ring? So our trapping potential is just a toroid. So what you do is you take the usual harmonic oscillator and subtract a constant radius from it. And then you can also have some freedom in the Z direction that is nice to play with because you have magnetostriction. So you can make it either like a hollow cylinder. I'll get to that later in the talk, or you can just push very much and make a two dimensional slice, which has its own properties. So what you see here is a torus for some parameter of this lambda. If you then have a, you can play with the dipole dipole interaction strength relative to the S wave scattering in the in the system. That's the parameter that you want to vary, vary. And you can actually achieve all the way from a perfect superfluid in a torus shown here to a density modulation. That's our super solid case that has cost quite some attention now to the droplet crystal. And then when you still go down the line here, you see that you get fewer and fewer droplets all sitting in this ring type of uh, confinement and then forming here a single droplet eventually. So you get all the way from a macro droplet to a droplet crystal to a superfluid. And what I will discuss very much in my talk now is how does this reflect in the rotational properties? And here the ring is of course very nice. You have heard about squids, superconducting ring structures, measuring uh, rotation and magnetic fields and so on. And this is very similar. I mean, this is like a, like a squid and also has been called an atotronic squid, so an aquid. So this is a perfect system for, for analyzing the degree of superfluidity in such a super solid. The first thing to do is to look at the ground states and to look at the superfluid fraction. So when you start from the pure superfluid, superfluid fraction is one. It's a little bit tricky to determine the superfluid fraction, but here the azimuthal symmetry of the system actually helps us because then we can use a recipe that was brought up by Leggett already in uh, 1970 that you just rotate it a little bit. And from the response of this little rotation, you can infer the moment of inertia and then the superfluid fraction is just the ratio of uh, purely superfluid minus the ratio between the actual moment of inertia and the classical moment of inertia, which you get by this trivial integration. So when you do this and you raise the interaction strengths, you see that the system here, first the superfluid, then the superfluid fraction descends and you get this density modulation. And finally, actually down here, the drain, if you just go further and further down, you will find an isolated droplet crystal. Now, maybe those of you who do gross there will be many in this audience, I think, you will immediately think that these values here are pretty large because in the LHY corrections that you can, as I, sh I showed the result from Petrov, but, uh, or, or the, the, the suggestion from Petrov, but you can do the same thing in, in the dipolar case. There are these papers by Lima and Pelster, they worked out how to do this. And if one does this, for two large um, values, there are some imaginary spurious contributions and blunt, bluntly we ignore them. And actually when you are at this parameter range, you see these parameters are not so small. So it's a little bit dubious whether one can actually do that. But let me tell you already at this point that it's a question of how you scale your parameters in the system. And if you choose a different norm, if you choose a different confinement, you can realize smaller uh, critical values of the interaction strength ratio that bring you in a, on a more safe land, but the overall physics doesn't change. So the, why the numbers are so, are so large here is actually because we didn't realize that this would be dangerous to do in the beginning, but then we found that it actually doesn't change a thing. So this is the reason why I dare to show you these relatively large values of FCD here, which is the ratio here of the dipole and, and contact strength. Why are rings interesting? Why, why on earth do you want to put this on a ring? And actually this brings me to, to take you back very long time to again to the 1970s 
where people thought about superfluids in toroids and exactly one dimensional toroids. There is this amazing paper from Bloch from 1973, who has shown that when you have a bosonic gas on a ring, the dispersion relation develops minima. And these minima occur when the angular momentum equals the number of bosons in the system. And not only that, but it's perfectly periodic. There's a proof for that. So you can mathematically show that this perfect periodicity exists. And at these minima, you see that there is a barrier to the non-rotating state. So physically, this means that once you are in such a minimum, you're protected from decaying to zero angular momentum if you have no dissipation in the system. And this periodicity is what we also call Bloch theorem, not to be mixed up with the Bloch theorem in the lattices, of course. So this is very inspiring. And uh, it was actually 2014 that this was shown with single component contact interacting Bose gases. This is a picture from, I think, from the group of uh, Gretchen Kampel, who was one of the pioneers in this field. And they used uh, ring-shaped confinement. And nowadays, it should not be any problem to realize this in experiments. And then they take a laser and stir the condensate in order to inflict angular momentum on it. So basically, and this is a little bit funny here, this looks like a big sausage, right? So like a Leonakov, or what we call in Sweden, a Falukov, that you have this constriction which is caused by the laser stirrer. And then you move this constriction. And so of course the superfluid doesn't care until you do it fast enough. And then you get all kinds of mess happening. But as long as you do it slowly, nothing really happens. When you do it faster, you can inflict a phase jump on the system and you get persistent current. Very similar to the picture by Bloch that I've shown you. So when you then realize that you have a metastability for this, I would like to go to the next slide. This metast metastability, this is the second little minimum here. So what is rotation? Rotation means subtracting minus L omega from your Hamiltonian, which means that you basically tilt the energy in various angles, depending on how large is omega. So you can actually reach a, a situation where you shake the system out from the minimum or you shake the system into the minimum. So eventually, by doing this up and down and up and down, there's hysteresis in the system. As I said, these results go quite back, quite long back in time. There's a theory paper by my colleague, George Kavulakis uh, here that who analyzed this theoretically. And then it was very much in the works of Ekel and uh, Wright and Ramanathan and uh, other people doing this by now almost 10 years ago. So now we ask the question, what happens if I do the same thing for a super solid. Dynamical steering is difficult. I'll get to that. So let's first of all look at rotational ground states. All we can do at this stage here, unfortunately so far, is that we can do gross and the extensions of it. So we do an extended gross where we incorporate the quantum fluctuations in a local density ad hoc uh, manner. Because simply these systems are so large, it's in 3D that all efforts so far to do this up in issue are bound to fail. We are working presently on trying to get an up initio in terms of coupled clusters, but this will come hopefully in the next one or two years to realization. So far, we only have extended gross If we do such a calculation, we have the freedom to restrict the angular momentum by a constraint. Normally, it would just iterate self-consistently into the, into the minimum, but one can strict by a boundary condition the angular momentum and then I can plot what we in Sweden call the Urast line. You know, it's known from nuclear physics that you ask yourself, if you choose a certain energy, what is the most dizzy state? And Urast means the most dizzy, you know. Uh, Ur is, is dizzy, and then Urast is the one that is most dizzy. And this was a concept developed in nuclear physics back in the, in the 70s also, actually. So this is the energy as a function of angular momentum. And when you are deeply in the superfluid regime, the ratio of dipole and contact is 1.9, you see that the superfluid, the, there's a vortex actually entering the system upon, upon rotation. So you see the density here opens a gate, lets the vortex pass. You see the face picture down here, the white lines are the contours of the density, and then the vorticity sets, sits at the center of the trap. So right in this minimum here, you have a vortex in the middle of the superfluid. 
What is a little bit intriguing is that when you raise, raise angular momentum in the beginning, you already see that you get this modulation of density here because the rotation here is, is mixing up with the excitations. We will get to that. Now let us increase the dipolar strength across the critical strengths where you see here that we go into, when you remember the picture of the uh, uh, superfluid fraction, this is where localization starts to happen. So now something fascinating happens, namely that you get a shift in the curvature of these so-called Uras lines, that you go from this downbended structure to something that has local minima and looks like intersecting parabola. We plot the density of the Gross-Pedevsky and also the phase here. And you see that initially the phase reflects just a solid body rotation. So you have this whole crystal of droplets that is rotating like a classical rigid body in the system. And now it passes this maximum, goes to the next minimum, and you see that the vortex has entered. So now it carries vorticity. So you have both a superfluid that carries a vortex and you have the solid body rotation of the, of the system. And that of course doesn't really match because to have L over N equal to unity, you would have to have a larger superfluid fraction so the only way to compensate for is that we have a counter flow in the system that takes up the remaining angular momentum. And then when you are at the unit vortex, you see really that the full that the unit vortex here is completely established at the minimum position. This game goes on. If you still increase epsilon, and I remind you that these values, they might seem very large, but we tried it with other sets of problems parameters and we found a similar behavior. So the, the largeness and maybe forbidden, forbiddenly large, large these parameters are, it doesn't really affect the overall results of this, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to tell you here, namely that you have this transition from the superfluid to a more or less rigid body motion when you have a completely crystallized droplet lattice. I told you before, I remind our, let us remind ourselves about the picture of hysteresis, that you have a hysteresis loop in the pure superfluid. If you have a just a homogeneous superfluid, you can rotate it up to a certain extent and nothing happens until the angular momentum jumps and you arrive at the unit vortex. Then again, nothing happens and you get the second vortex and the third and so on and so on. And uh, since you have this by stability with a metastable state, then this leads to hysteresis. And the hysteresis here first starts horizontally, jumps up and goes back and jumps down. Now in a super solid, this is a little bit different because you have both a classical rotation and a superfluid rotation, right? Or non-rotation, I should say. So the classical rotation here gives rise to a slope that is proportional to the solid body part of the moment of inertia. So you see you slope up linearly jump to the next vortex, slope down, you arrive at a different state. And if you do this for different superfluid fractions, you see that you actually get a different size of this hysteresis loop that is in a way proportional to the superfluid fraction in the system. And it's a simple consequence of this bistability where you have the two minima, one at zero angular momentum and one at L over N, L angular momentum over the norm equal to unity. Now, in the beginning, I showed you results for a homogeneous uh, Bose uh, condensate stirred by a laser dynamically. What I've just shown you was actually the static results that you ask for what is the ground state at a given trap rotation. Now I ask a different question. Can we actually dynamically steer the system? And this is, in, for my taste, a very daring thing to do because we do this in gross in a dynamical time-dependent version of gross which for me coming from an Aponitia direction is always like a little bit doubtful whether we can do it. So the, the, the main message is we should do it gently. We should not do it too fast and we should not do it too violently in order not to violate a gross But again, since these systems are so large, I wouldn't know anything better than to do a dynamical time-dependent gross so here you have our system. You see the, the dipolar crystal now in a little bit more slim 
ring in order to get rid of this nasty epsilon problem. So we decided to change parameters a little bit. And then in your ring potential, you can actually make a, what we call a weak link by having an angular dependent frequency term here. So you have the confinement that for some angle, it narrows in and you see this here in the red areas, the confinement really pushes the ring a little bit together. So uh, you have a region here where you have a constant ring confinement and then you have this narrow region with a red color here where you see a constriction. So basically you take this constriction and now you rotate the system. This is a little bit similar to another related problem that we are studying right now. This is when you have capillary flow. So you have a small thin capillary and then the super solid has to squeeze through. So what happens to these droplets? And this, this is a similar question here. You have this bump and the bump is pushing the droplets, but it's also pushing the superfluid. But as long as you push slowly, the superfluid part doesn't care, but certainly the droplets care. So the question is who wins and what is happening in the system? So uh, before we actually start to dynamically rotate this, I would like to show you that this link has um, drastic influence on the density distribution. If you look carefully here, you see the yellow line. This is the pure superfluid case. It develops a little bump here. You've seen this before. When I showed you the phase plots and the density plots, you saw that when the weak link enters, you get, or when the vortex enters, you get a little bit of this raising of the density close to the vortex entry point. With the weak link is very similar. You see an increase of the density. Then this is the link here. So it causes some depletion of the density and uh, you can then increase the dipole strength and you see that with more and more dipole strength, this well-known droplet lattice is building up, right? So you see that they get sequence of maxima here that very well resemble the droplet structures. But where you have the weak link, the droplets are pushed. One can also understand that this maximum here gets a little bit elevated because the dipoles, they're repelling side by side. So then close to the empty region, there is a little bit more room to accommodate more dipoles. That's why these are a little bit larger. If you have a thin link, there are some commensurability effects. You can make, the, I mean, in a way it's very interesting because the dipolar super solid itself makes the link intrinsically. And this is like an intrinsically built-in Josephson junction that uh, has many, many reoccurrences. So you have as many of these junctions as you have droplets. So when you make the link thin enough, it will actually not disturb the droplet lattice too much. So the size of the link, the height and the width of the link is very decisive for its physical behavior. What I will look at first now is actually these Uras lines again. The Uras lines are moderately affected by the width and height of the link. You get a very similar picture for wide link and the, and the thin link. But you see here the same pattern that we had before, that when, the, when you have a perfect crystal, or next to perfect crystal, I should say, you get these two branches. We saw that the first branch is only classical body rotation. And the second branch is then classical body rotation plus superfluid unit vortex. When you approach the superfluid regime, you see here for the yellow regime, for smaller values of this uh, dipolar strength parameter, it resembles very much the superfluid case, but now this has a little bit shifted maximum position that gets rounded off from the position of the weak link. There's a very interesting difference between the superfluid and the, or next to superfluid, I should say, and the crystallized region or next to crystallized region because you see that in the more superfluid case, you open a gap here. So you would have the next excitations, you have the next branches and you have a decisive gap, which makes it possible to have a two-state model where you have uh, two possible uh, uh, transition states here. And this has actually been suggested with just superfluid rings as a qubit uh, realization. So this is quite interesting from that perspective actually. But when you go more and more super solid, this behavior changes, you lose the gap, so to speak, and you will have another branch here with other crossings higher. So these Uras lines, they are interesting and they are very similar to what has been seen in general for uh, single component gases with a weak link. Now, 
let us do this story dynamically. So we take an omega start at zero, have place our weak link in the dipolar supersolid, and then we start to rotate. Now the omega is increasing here until 250 milliseconds have passed, and then it stays at a constant level. What you see here is the angular momentum that comes out from the calculation. And you see that if omega is not too large, you see a little bit of wiggling around. But if you are above a certain critical strength of the omega, you see that it eventually takes a first vortex and it also eventually takes a second vortex. And to make this a little bit visible, I have brought you some uh, videos here. And uh, so what you see here is the super solid with the weak link on the left side and the face picture on the right side. And what you can actually see is that if omega is small enough, nothing really spectacular happens apart from a little bit of wiggling, a little bit of change in the face, but not really much. You see, if you look very carefully, you see that these droplets, they move back and forth. So one has, by putting this little bit of weak link rotation, already excited a little bit of one of the low lying modes showing back and forth. So it's like a swinging mode, the droplets start to swing. Now, let's do this for the higher rotation. So you see here, now we go to, to the case where you get two vortices and you see what is happening. That first of all, the maybe I should show this again, that first of all, not much, you get the swinging back and forth, but suddenly you start to see a depletion at the position of the weak links. And this depletion then travels around along the circumference of the ring. And uh, you have also in the face, you can see a clearly established twofold vortex, which fits well with having an angular momentum of two units per norm uh, here that has these small oscillations because we are still driving the system. Now we do the same thing for a thin link and you see it's a little bit different. The main difference here is that the thin link actually manages to first overshoot and then settles to unit angular momentum. But also when you do a faster stirring, it becomes again very similar. So let's uh, look at that also dynamically. So you see, first of all, nothing happens. And then you get a very clear two vortex in this region here, but eventually then the one vortex leaves and it settles down to one vortex solution. Same, same game again for a larger omega. First of all, nothing happens, but then you see very clearly the swinging back and forth. And also you see very clearly this density de de depletion in the system. And I should, I forgot to say actually that everything is plotted in the rotating frame so that we don't get confused. It's just that the weak link has a certain velocity and then we go into the rotating frame by subtracting exactly that rotational term from the outcome. Now, it's very fascinating to, to think about these um, excitations when you stir fast enough. So what I have here is now a plot of a radial density. You see, I plot the density along the angle or around the circumference, but I also integrate over the radial in Z direction. So this is like a, it's not a three-dimensional density integral, but it's like a like an angular density, what you might, might want to call it. And since one dimension is missing in this integral, everything has units of one over micrometer. So this is what is shown here, sort of the density along this rim, so to speak. So you see that first, when you begin to rotate, not much happens, but then you actually realize that there's a depletion here and this forms like regular patterns. You see these downslopes and these are solitons forming out from the state upon rotation. So you see, you first have a homogeneous superfluid and when you rotate fast enough, you see that the density modulation sets in. So it's kind of that this rotating link already sort of manages to excite the system and, 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 and mess around with its rotons and so on. I can show this again. So you see, first nothing happened and now you rotate too fast and now you get this depletion. And you also see that this solitonic wave-like thing is remaining here for many repetitions. You have this density depletion. This is, I think, the more fascinating case to see this density modulation originating out from the purely superfluid regime. But 
we can actually also go into the more super solid case. So here you have this very well known uh, super solid limit now in a toroidal structure. And again, you see the solitonic lines forming, but now everything becomes a little bit more messy. So let's look at the movie. You see, there is a, the weak link manages to irritate the droplet lattice enough so that it spits off smaller droplets that are then messing around uh, with, the, with the rest of the localization. And you have a soliton that is a solitonic wave-like structure that is circulating in the system. So much about uh, uh, the, the dynamical rotation. It is also interesting to imprint vorticity on the system and then just switch off the trap. This is what I show you here. This is a simulation after imprinting several units of quantized angular momentum. Then you switch off the trap. And since the dipoles are repelling each other in this, in this case here, uh, when, you, when you have a non-rotating system and you let them expand, some of them will move inside, some of them will move outside. That's why you have a maximum here in the center. And please note that this is a super saturated uh, uh, scale here. So that white means white on both ends. So this is actually a maximum at the center. It's been very difficult to plot this in a better way. So this is to cope with that this looks almost like a white spot, but it's actually a maximum is a yellow spot. And now when you go to higher levels of quantization, you see it relatively dramatic hole developing at the center and upon expansion, this hole should actually become seeable. I think if you would do this in an experiment, I would hope that one should be able to see that you get a max, you get a minimum or a hole here instead of a maximum at the center of such a track. This is uh, so much about rotating a usual dipolar uh, uh, super solid. And again, for this audience, I almost don't dare to show these slides, you know, because I think from these papers, almost everybody is in the audience. So I can only wave hello here and say that this is fantastic. We are very excited to see all these things happening. And um, we, as a theorist, we love the idea to be able to manipulate the dipole-dipole interactions that not only you can change the strengths and all that, but you can actually also change the sign. I mean, this is fascinating. This is fantastic. So what usually is repulsive, when you have side to side interactions becomes attractive when you have head to tail. And um, that's of course very uh, uh, intriguing for, for, for us doing all these Kospodevsky simulations. And I was reading with a lot of excitement and fun. I was reading a thesis here from Tillman's group. This is a Wenzel's thesis from 2018, you see. So this is already quite some years back. And actually it has been lying on my desk for, for, for quite some time. And then I forgot about it and then I took it up again. And he has been describing this very interesting case of pancakelets. So he says, I think at page 93 or something, he says that if you actually turn around the dipole interactions, you get pancakes instead of eggs. And this is very interesting now, I think when we look at super solids and vortices. So this is what we did. Now we took up this suggestion and um, simulate what happens actually when you change the contact interaction so that you get into this super solid range, but not, not in the, the forming eggs, but now forming disks because of the same change sign of the dipole interaction. What you get is a, is a lattice of overlapping disks stacked on top of each, each other. Now, dipolar stacks are not so new. I think this has been done uh, with optical lattices, cutting a dipolar gas and seeing the interactions between different slices. It's also been done with electric dipole, dipole moments. Uh, 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 Luis Santos has been publishing a paper on that, I think. And uh, now we do it just with, just with the dysposium, just by changing the interaction. So, and this is the phase diagram that you see here. So you get really different ranges of parameters where you see a, a, a difference from isolated droplets to super solid stacks and to regular superfluids. Now, the usual thing to do to sort of estimate the degree of uh, super solidity is to look at the contrast. It's making a smooth transition from unity where you have a, a perfect uh, superfluid then to, to, to zero. And the same as you can do by using Leggett's upper bound and calculate the superfluid fraction this way. The two methods are sort of complementary, nothing new in that. 
and um, you see the same thing happening, but just with the with the opposite uh, sign. And then, if you plot the density profiles here, you see that uh, whoops, you see that uh, there's an intersection point here, and uh, you can think. I mean, when does it make the transition from one blob to many and to a super solid? And uh, this is difficult always to estimate from just looking at the density distributions. That's not really a clear sign. Um, the, the one way to do it is of course, to do a linear response type of thing and calculate the Bogolubov excitations. And for this case, they are particularly clear, I would say. So you see that the mode going down and up again here, the X like thing, and then the Goldstone thing. And you see that really, here at this point you have this crossing of, of branches which coincides with the point when you see in the density that the, that changes from from homogeneous to, to localized so now you may ask that okay but we already know about superfluids so why is this so interesting and for me the interest comes when you think about vortices because vortices are much nicer to look at when you have something flat that you set rotating it's kind of kind of annoying to look at vortices when you have a flat trap and then you have the eggs in the middle and then you see the vortices in the interstitial regions and it's a mess you don't know what is like just a minimum because of all the eggs or you know is it a vortex and then it disturbs the eggs so it's kind of kind of difficult but in um in if, if you just turn it around and look at the stack systems the vortices should be much more clear i think and uh, we are presently trying to find ground states for these systems ground state vortices what is lattices and so on I can only show you here today some first results about imprinting a vortex here with a twofold quantization. And this, because it's imprinted, is only at the center, but I would think that these would actually make a vortex lattice. But when you imprint them, you see that the point here where you, where you build up this super solid structure, but you start to build up the crystallization, leaving the pure uh, superfluid regime shifts actually actually for increasing vorticity. So you see that all these curves here are shifted to the left, the higher the quantization is. Now you may ask what happens actually in this. Now I tell you something that is super exciting at the moment and that we are evaluating with full speed. And I hope that in the near vicinity of time, we can have a manuscript out on this. When you have persistent current in a, in a single ring, right? And now you you split it. What will happen? I mean, will the persistent current distribute on all the stacks, or will it just remain, or will you get solitons, or what is going to happen? Now I see time is running out. Uh, I'm I'm late, but I will want. Can can I flash the last part? If it's uh, one minute or so, yeah, then it's yes. Fine. It will be one minute. One minute, very short. I, let me just flash the last part. I think this the Zoom talks are a little bit more difficult to 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 know the timing. So, but I would really love to show you because now we go up an issue, and I just remind you now of this um, of this paper by by Petrov. This was not for dipolar but for contact contact, and we do now the same thing, but let me skip this one. But we do it in the few body regime. It's not only I mean when you go to low dimensions, you don't have this atom number restriction that you need. Uh, tens and hundreds of atoms to make a self-bound state, but in low dimensions, you can get them already for like two and three and four. And so we said, okay, let us try to do this thing exactly without resorting to all these dramatic ad hoc approximations and diagonalize brute force. So we have developed diagonalization tools to map out the exact diagonalization results, which compared to other methods like quantum Monte Carlo and so on has the advantage that we also get the excitations. This is big, so this is our old computer. Now we have a new one, but we got this actually also this month only, so I don't have a picture of it. And what you see then is when you look at pair correlations and these exact densities, you see a dramatic change from the few body superfluid to a localized state. Very similar to what we have discussed for droplet formation. And when you do a corresponding Burgel-Lubov analysis, you see that it happens sort of in the vicinity. If you look at the excitation spectrum, I showed you Higgs modes before, I showed you the occurrence of the Goldstone, and actually these are interesting precursors. You see, you have a monopole mode here. These are the excitations, low-lying excitations. You see, you have this precursor of the monopole mode, and you have this 
higher angular momentum modes that actually collapse down to zero when you increase the particle number. So these are very interesting precursors and we think it's very exciting to see. And this links actually back to a work that we did together with Selim Jochem and his group to study how do these phase transitions emerge atom by atom? I mean, what is the few body analog of these beautiful things that we have seen? Now the droplets, we know they only exist for large atom numbers, but you can go to low dimensions and, and study this actually in a different setting. Also the rotational behavior here is similar. This is the last thing I want to say is that you see that you get the superfluid behavior changing over to rigid body rotation upon self binding of this system that is made by four and four atoms. So these exact organizations, they will then be a, a great asset actually to study things like superfluid drag and, 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 and related effects. And with this, I would like to, to thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you these things here in Zoom. I'm very sad that I cannot be there. And in order to make up for that, uh, please, if you, if you have questions or want to discuss more on this, we could just by email arrange a Zoom meeting and then discuss it face to face. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and we have time maybe for one uh, question. Is there a question here in the audience? Uh, yes, please. So, um, for these last few body uh, stuff you showed, like these spectra, if, if I remember, like, so you said they're ED spectra right now. So, it, so you have all of the states basically up there. And then if you take through the dynamics, um, could, do you ever calculate the overlaps of your dynamical state with the spectrum you have available now? Yeah. And how does it mix the, the different modes basically when you do oh, the, the theory in the different regimes? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Actually, this is what we are doing right now because we the, the exact diagonalization that I shown you was only static. And but with the method that we have been developing is actually allowing a full quantum dynamics also. So I think the next step would be then to to actually have such a dynamical rotation of a weak link and, and see what the exact quantum dynamics is going to, to do to the state. And then I think there's also an, an, another example, which is super interesting, is that you can have a disbalanced system. So you can have an unequal number of particles. So you have like n prime bosons from one kind and n double prime from the other kind. That means that you form a droplet inside a, a superfluid. So you have a compound system. And that you can actually build if you're like six and eight or you know 10 and 12, it would already show you the, the dominant uh, features of a larger system. Now, what we found from gross or from extended gross is that such a compound system actually uh, already has quite a lot of the super solid properties because you have one droplet traveling around in the superfluid. So it's not so different from a fully fledged super, super solid structure. So I think this will be super interesting in the, in the future, super, super interesting super solids. <laughs> So okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie. I could I, I could listen uh, to this forever. Uh, as you know, and we should continue this discussion uh, uh, later oh, please. on. Yeah. Oh, please. for the next speaker. We, we we have to move on. So thanks a lot again. Well, and, thank uh, you, thank you, <laughs> and thank you for having me. It was fantastic to be able to do this via Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for being with us. And. Uh, yeah. I'm sad to miss out on all the other things, but hello from here. Hello from Jund. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, we are continuing now with the uh, talk by Valentin uh, Walter and uh, we have to get uh, him set up here. So, see you. <laughs> see you. <laughs>